You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone and welcome once again to A Bible Answer. I'm Mike McDaniel and I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. Thanks for watching A Bible Answer today. We have three gospel preachers with us to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. Hello, I'm Hal Ferguson. I'm the Director of Extension Studies with the World Bible Institute in McDonough, Georgia. Hello, I'm Nat Evans. I preach for the Hickory Grove Congregation near Alamo, Kentucky. Hello, I'm Adam Evans. I just returned from Tanzania, East Africa as a missionary for three years, and now I'm working as the minister and gospel preacher for the Valdosta Church of Christ in Tuscumbia, Alabama. We're glad to have each of these brethren with us today. They've all been on before, but this is the first time that Brother Nat Evans and his son Adam have been on together, and we're glad that worked out. We have some great questions today. Let's get right to them. To Brother Ferguson, we have this one. Should we partake of the Lord's Supper every Sunday? Brother Ferguson. Thank you for this question. On the night of Jesus' betrayal, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper in the emblems of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, which represented or would represent the uh, body and the blood of Jesus Christ that was given uh, for our sins on the cross in Matthew 26, 26 to 39, and also 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 to 26. In Acts chapter 20, verses 6 and 7, we have a historical record by Luke of what the disciples did. And on Paul's third missionary journey, part of his missionary team went on and waited for Paul and the other uh, group for, in Troas for about five, for five days. And once they were all together, the whole group waited another seven days. And then Luke, the historian, records, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. It's interesting to me that in the discussion of the frequency of the Lord's Supper uh, on the first day of the week, that very few churches seem to understand or misunderstand Paul's instructions in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, which says that the churches gave upon the first day of the week. They correctly understood that that meant every first day of the week, and so the collection was taken. Yet some of these same people may seem to have trouble understanding Acts chapter 20, verse 7, um, and also as well as Acts 2, 42, where Luke records, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. Furthermore, in Paul's rebuke of the Corinthians for abusing the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, 17-20, Paul writes, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest unto, among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. You notice there's three times that Paul talks about how they came together. They, he says, ye came together, or ye come together, and when ye come together in the church, and then when ye come together, therefore, into one place. And all of these phrases indicate that their coming together was a regular practice. Even though they had perverted the Lord's Supper, yet Paul doesn't condemn their frequency for coming together to take the Lord's Supper, but only their abuse of it when they came together. But finally, I want to mention that God commanded every Jew to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy, Exodus 20 and verse 8. No faithful Jew had to be reminded or to be told every Sabbath was the day that they were to keep. Uh, since there is one Saturday, one Sabbath in each week, then the Jew understood he had to keep every Sabbath. And the same reasoning is true with respect to the Lord's Supper. We're commanded to observe the Lord's Supper. The early church did observe the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, on Sunday. There is only one Sunday in each week, therefore we should observe the Lord's Supper each and every Sunday, each and every Lord's Day. Thank you again for this question. Thank you, Brother Ferguson. 
Now to Brother Evans. The person says, my child has left home to go to college. How can I impress upon him the need to attend worship at a local congregation where he now lives? Brother Evans. First, I sympathize with your situation. My wife and I went through this situation three different times with three young men who are now older and they have their own families. In 3 John 4, no greater joy have I none than this, than that my children are found walking in the truth. I hope that the choice has already been made to choose a university where this young man will be taught to make a life as well as how to make a living. It still is true that evil companionships corrupt good morals or good manners, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. So it's very important that one have or choose the proper roommate at college and then to be very careful with the young ladies that he chooses to date. It is still true that from among those that we choose to date eventually, one of those will be the, the wife that we choose for a lifetime. It is extremely vital to encourage your son to choose a faithful congregation that has a sound gospel preacher. Then write him a letter occasionally. Every college student enjoys receiving mail and encourage him in those letters. In the next place, write a letter to the elders of the congregation to which he has chosen to attend, encouraging them, perhaps along with the preacher also, to visit him for the purpose of encouraging him to remain faithful and attend the services of the church faithfully, Matthew 6, verse 33. Then strive to always keep the door of communication open with a child. They're going to have problems. Let's be willing to listen and to try to encourage them. Teach them to be a leader and not a follower. To stand up for themselves and for what's right even if they must stand alone. Then I want to say something else, and that is uh, what I told, my wife and I told our three sons when they went away to college. We said, it's time for you to go out now and stand on your own two feet. We have tried to teach you well. We've made some mistakes, we are sure. We ask for forgiveness for that. But we encourage you now to be a faithful Christian for the remainder of your life. And it will be up to you to make that decision. Joshua 24, 14 to 15. Choose you this day whom you will serve, but it's free for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. Thank you for this good question. Thank you very much, Brother Evans, for that very good answer. And now to Brother Adam Evans, we have this question. Do you believe we can work our way to heaven, Brother Evans. I want to start off asking a couple of questions and then giving some brief answers and then we'll go a little bit further into that study. Firstly, on our way to heaven, on our path to heaven, on our journey to heaven, are we going to work? Well, the answer is yes. And the next question is, on our path to heaven, are we commanded by our Lord to be about good works? And the answer is yes. The next question is, on our way to heaven or on our path or journey to heaven, uh, will those works merit or earn our salvation? The answer is no, they will not. And so can we earn our entrance into heaven? The answer is no. And so we must realize that there are several different ways that the New Testament uses the word works. And uh, because of time, we'll look at three different ways that the word works is used in the New Testament. Firstly, it is used as the works of law. Secondly, it is used of works that merit salvation. And also, thirdly, it talks about the works of the law of faith. In Galatians chapter 2 and in verse 16, 
It says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. And the latter part of that verse says, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And truly this in context is dealing with the law of Moses, but you could also see that law in general by itself simply sets a standard uh, of what is right, what is wrong, and a law of itself does not save. In Galatians chapter 3 and in verse 21, it says, If there had been a law which could have given life, then verily righteousness should have been by the law. And so, for example, if the law of Moses and the Old Testament law could have provided eternal life, then we would have had eternal life by that law and that law alone without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21, the latter part of that verse says, For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And so ultimately, if we can be saved just by the law and by works, then we wouldn't have to have that sacrifice of Jesus Christ. A second way that the word works is used in the New Testament is that of works of merit, that merit or earn our salvation. And in Ephesians chapter 2, and in verse 9, it says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. And so there are not those works that we can do where we've performed them in our life, and then when we get to heaven, and we're standing there, and we're waiting to be judged, um, we can say, I deserve to be here, you know, uh, because I've done this or I've done that, and therefore I've earned this wage, and you must let me in. It doesn't work that way. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, Now to him that worketh, is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. And so uh, we see that these, these types of works of, of merit or earning our salvation, they are excluded. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, it says, Not of works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. And so we cannot merit our entry into heaven. We cannot merit or earn uh, forgiveness of sins. We do not deserve forgiveness, nor are we owed eternity. And without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we are truly without hope. And so we cannot be saved by our own righteousness or the things that we've done. And we cannot earn our way to heaven by working good works. And number three, we have a way in which works are used in the New Testament, and that is the works of the law of faith. Now, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 27, it talks about that. And it asks the question, where is boasting then? It is excluded. Now, when is boasting excluded? Well, he says, is it by the law of works? And the answer is no. But boasting is excluded by the law of faith. And so in the New Testament, we are to be about good works as New Testament Christians. Ephesians 2.10 tells us that we are his workmanship created unto Christ Jesus for good works. And so we must be about good works in our life. In James 2 and 24, it says, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say that he have faith and have not works? Can faith save him? And so James 2.17 says, Even so faith, if it have not works, is dead, being alone. In James 2.24, it says, By works a man is justified, and not by faith only. And in James 2 and verse 26, it says, Faith without works is dead. So when we go to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6, we see that faith, which works by love, is the type of faith that we are to have. It's to be an active, obedient, working faith, a faith that works by love. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 10, we are to be fruitful in every good work. And over and over in Titus chapter 2 and Titus chapter 3, we see that we are to be a people uh, zealous of good works, ready to every good work, and those that are constantly being involved in good works. And truly, we're going to be judged by our works according to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 17. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, over and over, Jesus says, I know thy works, and then passes judgment based upon what their activity in the body of Christ. And lastly, in Revelation chapter 20, verses 12 through 13, it says that the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So we go back to the original question. On our way to heaven, on our path to heaven, are we going to work? Yes. Are we commanded? Uh, to follow the will of God, to obey the will of God, and to be active and, and, and working in our faith? Yes. 
However, does our works merit or earn our salvation? And the answer is no. So thank you so much for that good question. Thank you. We've reached the halfway point of our program today, and we want to offer to you a free tract. The tract today is entitled, The Lord's Church is Different. And this tract was written by the late Brother Garland Elkins. It is the first time that this tract has ever been offered on a Bible answer. So if you'd like to have this tract, or if you'd like to have our free at lesson Bible correspondence course, or both, or to send us your Bible question, just contact us. You can write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may email us your question at a Bible answer at earthlink.net, or you can call our toll-free number 1-800-436-0463 and request the materials. And if you do so, please leave your full address so that we may meet your request. You may also go to our website, the web address you're seeing there on the screen, www.abibleanswertv.org. There's a contact page there where you can reach us. And all of our past programs of A Bible Answer are archived there for your viewing and for your searching. Back to our questions today to Brother Ferguson. Brother Ferguson, the query says, Must we break the communion bread off or may we partake of individual pieces? Brother Ferguson. Thank you for this question. This is a, um, a relatively uh, recent question and one that seems to be asked more nowadays than perhaps in the past that I remember. Um, and basically the question comes down to uh, whether one can use uh, individual pieces, pre-cut pieces of, of bread, unleavened bread, um, or use one loaf and pinch off uh, a piece of that bread from that loaf. And in looking at that question, I think there's some similarity to the question that has been around for a little while, and that is whether it is scriptural to use individual communion cups or to drink from one cup. And so what to me seems to um, rise or fall uh, as to the truthfulness or uh, falsity of one would be true or false of the other. And I think it's interesting that as we look at these, we, the question is really whether the physical relationship of the emblems of the Lord's Supper uh, to one another is of, real, of any real consequence or is the real significance in the fact of what those emblems represent. Well, for example, when you look at, for example, Paul, he spent three years in the city of Ephesus in Acts 20 and verse 31. And while he was there in Ephesus, he wrote the letter to the church of Corinth. And if you look at a map, Corinth is about 300 or rather 250 miles east of the city of Ephesus and um, or rather uh, west of the city of Ephesus across the Aegean Sea. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 16 of that letter, Paul says this. He says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now notice that Paul uses the word cup, singular. And notice that Paul also uses the first person plural word, pronoun, we. And so Paul, again, he's in Ephesus, but he's saying to the Corinthians, we are blessing the cup, and we are breaking the same bread. Well, obviously, Paul is not in their local proximity. Paul is not talking about the same literal cup because Paul is 250 miles away. So what is Paul talking about? Well, he's saying that the spiritual meaning is in what the contents represent not in the number of containers or whether the bread was broken from the same loaf or whether another loaf or whether it was in individual pieces. And so obviously the fellowship of the body of Christ is not determined by which loaf one's bread uh, or piece of bread comes from, but that it is indeed unleavened bread which represents the Lord's body. And to be consistent, if one is going to bind a single cup or a single piece of bread for all the members to drink or to eat from, then all Christians around the world would have to drink of that same literal cup and would have to break from that same literal loaf. Of course, such is not only absurd, but is also impossible. But thank you for this good question. Thank you, Brother Ferguson. I am reminded of what the Lord said in Luke uh, 22 and verse 19, where the Bible says He took bread and gave thanks and break it 
and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now, notice, he broke the bread to give them the bread, because if he had not broken it, he could not have given it. And that bread was to be symbolic of his body, which was given for them for a sacrifice. As Brother Ferguson, Ferguson has said, I don't see any express statement that the actual breaking is supposed to be symbolic of anything or something in addition to what the bread is meant to be a symbol of, which is the sacrifice of the body of Christ. It appears to be incidental to the real purpose at hand and not a, a deliberate action that was obligatory for every individual who partakes of it. The breaking is mentioned just because they were thin, flat cakes of bread that were used on that occasion. And so, to eat it, it was necessary to break it. But I don't find that the actual breaking of bread is directly connected in symbolic fashion to the, to the broken body of the Lord. It's just a means of distribution only. Thanks for that good question and that good answer. Now to Brother Nat Evans, we have this question. What is meant by the expression, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. 1 Corinthians 11 and 31 is the passage. Brother Evans. This passage in the American Standard Version says, But if we discerned ourselves, we should not be judged. This is found in a context dealing with abuses of the Lord's Supper, where people in partaking of the fruit of the vine and the breaking of the bread in remembrance of the Lord's body, they were not doing that going in their minds all the way back to the cross. That served as an abuse of the Lord's Supper, failing to discern the Lord's body. That being the case, if they would not repent of that situation, they would face the judgment or the wrath of God. However, if they would repent and change their practice or their conduct relative to the abuse of the Lord's Supper and do so with a proper attitude and partake of the proper emblems, the bread representing the body of Jesus on the cross, the unleavened bread, then the fruit of the vine representing the blood of Christ that Jesus shed, but carrying their minds all the way back to Calvary. And if they would change and do that, they would not face the wrath of God. They would not be condemned. There is a vital principle here that needs to be recognized. That is, if we're guilty of violating the Word of God in any way, if we will repent of it, and change our ways, and conduct ourselves as the Lord has taught us in His Word, we will then not have to face the wrath or the judgment of God. Thank you for this good question. Thank you. And now to Brother Adam Evans. We have this question. Please explain 1 Timothy 5, 9, and 10. What is the enrolling of widows mentioned? Brother Evans. In, in first. Timothy chapter 5, 9 and 10, the enrolling of widows is taking those that are widows indeed who are desolate, who have been left alone, who have no family that can support them, and putting them on the, the, the monthly budget, if you will, of a congregation and providing them with continuous support. And so those, those that are 60 years uh, old and older who do not have family members that can support them, if you're able to put them onto the church treasury, the monthly budget, and support them, then they should be supported. However, if they're younger, then they are to marry in this context. And then also, if they have family members, then those family members are required to take care of those widows, to pay and to compensate them and to take care of them and provide aid and relief unto them. Now, it is the case that in this passage it tells us that if we do not provide for our own, especially as those of the faith, we're worse than an infidel. We've denied the faith. And so it's really significant for us if we have family members that ha need care, that are widows, that we take care of it and that the church is not burdened and that it doesn't have the responsibility of caring for those that have family members that are members of the body of Jesus Christ. 
And so thank you so much for that good question. We appreciate very much the efforts by Brother Ferguson, Brother Nat Evans, Brother Adam Evans. They've done such a great job today in answering your questions, and we appreciate their efforts very much. We want to announce today uh, something that will soon be occurring. It is an area-wide gospel meeting that will be held at the Luther F. Carson Four River Center at 100 Kentucky Avenue in Paducah, Kentucky. This area-wide gospel meeting is sponsored by congregations of the Churches of Christ throughout Western Kentucky. The meeting will be held August 6th, 7th, and 8th, Sunday night, Monday night, and Tuesday night. Singing will begin at 6.30 p.m. each evening. The sermons will begin around 7 o'clock. And each evening, a lesson will be presented by Brother Cliff Goodwin from Aronaton, Alabama. I know Brother Goodwin, and he's an outstanding gospel preacher, and you will enjoy uh, hearing him immensely. Now, following his sermon each night, there will be a panel question and answer session that will be moderated by yours truly. I appreciate the invitation that was extended to me to moderate this uh, question and answer session uh, each of the three nights. I think it will be most enjoyable, and the questions will be answered uh, each evening by Brother Goodwin and also by, my understanding is, another panelist as well. And so this should make for a most enjoyable evening, August 6th, 7th, and 8th. We want to invite people throughout the western Kentucky, southern Illinois, uh, southeast Missouri, northwest Tennessee area to come and be a part of this area-wide gospel meeting. We're expecting a large crowd. Of course, it's a beautiful building, a great location there on the river. And uh, we're just looking forward to it. And we want to cordially invite you to attend. Again, that's August the 6th, 7th, and 8th. We're glad today that you have watched a, a Bible Answer with us. We hope you'll tell other people about the program. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible Answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with a faithful Church of Christ in your area.